Well, thank you for that uh, welcome. It's lovely to be with you. Um, yeah, I'm Graham. I'm a pastor of a church plant in Cambridge uh, and also the director of independent ministry training, not, not director of independent ministry in totality uh, at Oak Hill. Um, I've spent a bit of time over the recent months reading and a little bit of writing and some preaching on the doctrine of sin. So it's sort of an area I'm kind of working through. Um, One of the things that struck me about it is what an enormous topic it is um, uh, and how significant it is. Um, When when someone asked me to to, to come here, I can't remember when when you asked me, but it was a long time ago. And so he asked me to write something. So I wrote some fairly generic paragraph about sin, and I'm not going to talk about that at all. um, Because what I wanted to do was, I'm going to call it uh, the dynamics of sin. What I want to do, rather than look at, you know, we could look at all sorts of things, couldn't we? We could look at, you know, what it means to sin in Adam, and we could look at all the results of sin and uh, total depravity and all the various doctrinal areas. What I want to do is to narrow in on, effectively, how sin works. What are some of its sort of dynamics, its workings? If you, took, if you look, lifted the lid up, as it were, or the bonnet up on the car called sin, what would the engine be? And, and how, how, how does it function? Um, so uh, we're going to think about that in a variety of ways. I have a handout for you. And um, I kind of, I, for some reason, I think I pictured us sitting around tables. Um, and we're not sitting around tables. So my first challenge for you is going to be handling a very large <laughs> um, handout. But um, feel very free to um, fold it in whatever way is appropriate. Um, yeah, well, not all of it's that big, actually. It's big, it's big in the middle. So on the handout, what we have is um, Genesis 3 in the middle, and we're going to think about that uh, shooting off into some sections on the side, which is why I've laid it out uh, as I have with some other passages. Um, but you might like to turn in your Bibles to Genesis 3. I've got the, the main bit of Genesis 3, 1 to 7, sitting there in the middle of the handout, but we're going to be looking further afield around it as well, so it might be helpful uh, to have that open. Let's just make a few sort of introductory comments as those go round. Um, I do think sin is a fairly neglected uh, topic um, uh, within the church. It can feel like it's a, something of a given, but not something we then talk about very much. As Simon's already mentioned, it it doesn't always fit in our culture very well. Um, It's perfectly possible we kind of go silent on sin. But our doctrine of sin is is very foundational. And foundational things are important because other things get built on them. Um, If you change it or neglect it, the, the building becomes unstable. I think you can argue that most heresies through the history of the church either come directly from or are implicitly connected to doctrine of sin. Um, It's very, very true in something like like a Pelagian heresy, if you know that, Um, and looking at man's ability to be able to live well. But if you change that, you end up changing what you need to be saved from. You end up changing the work of the cross. You end up changing the work of the spirit. But if you come up from another angle, look at something like an Arian heresy, which changes you know, Christology, doctrine of Christ. Well, you change his person, well, you end up changing his work. And if you change his work, you end up changing, again, what it, what it is he has to do for us to save us. And once again, you're actually back to what it is we need to be saved from. What is sin? How does it work? Uh, how does it bind us, what are its results, and so on. So it's a very foundational topic. It's also a very explanatory topic. It explains what has gone wrong with the world, uh, with us. As I, as it's interesting, as I listen to the news now, since I preached, a, I preached an eight-part series on sin over recent months, and I actually I think I listen to the news slightly differently because sin explains our world better. It also explains us better. 
And as we look at, as we lift up the bonnet, as it were, and look inside, I want us to want to walk away. I was praying for us as I came down that we might walk away with a better understanding of ourselves and how we work, and therefore better able to fight sin and to minister to others caught in sin. So, a foundational topic, uh, an explanatory topic. Well, let's look at Genesis 3 for a moment. Let me read. Genesis 3, 1 to 7, middle of the page. Now, the snake was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the snake, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the snake said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Uh, we're going to begin on that left-hand side. I've called false faith, some headings there. Um, you'll know the context. Creation, made in the image of God to rule the world, placed in the garden back in chapter 2, uh, verses 8 and 9, being told uh, that there are trees uh, that are good for food, pleasing to the eye, and in the middle, the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. Given the command in verses 16 and 17 of chapter 2, eat from any tree you like, except the knowledge of good and evil. I do think the tree of knowledge of good and evil is symbolic. I, I, I'm slightly agnostic on some elements of this. I do think Adam and Eve were real historical characters and so on. I do think there was a historical fall. I do think this tree is symbolic. I don't think the fruit actually gave you knowledge of good and evil. I think it pictures the idea of deciding good and evil for yourself making yourself the decision maker. And I imagine that's a fairly accepted, a very common understanding of that knowledge and the action of eating it. Uh, the snake, of course, here represents Satan. Uh, that becomes uh, clearer as the Bible narrative goes on. Um, and we'll come back to why he's pictured as a serpent here in a bit. Uh, he is crafty, we're told. It's not necessarily a bad word. It's used positively elsewhere in Scripture. But the, it's kind of like, you know, he was, he was quite clever. That's all it's really saying. But this is obviously cleverness used in a bad cause, which is why it then becomes kind of crafty, kind of nasty. Now, you see how Satan begins. Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Um, okay, I'm going to get you think, doing some thinking at various points, and I often preach in a more interactive way, so I'll ask you questions. Okay? So when I ask a question, it's almost certainly not rhetorical. Okay? <laughs> I, 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 I might ask rhetorical questions, and I'll, you'll have to judge, but, but probably not. So, so, what are the most significant bits of his question there? That's not rhetorical. Did God say, so questioning God's word, yeah, altering God's word, okay, so changing it, and you mustn't eat from any tree, so it's not just did he say what he actually said, did he say something he didn't say, but it's close to what he did say, and as a result, arousing some kind of suspicion. So first of all, I want to talk about God's word being twisted in sin. He changes it, any tree, no. God hadn't said that. If you twist someone's words, you twist their character. You know, it's what happens in gossip, isn't it? You know, so-and-so said, and out comes a sentence. But if so-and-so didn't say those words, you have now just misrepresented them, and what you will do is change the way somebody thinks of them. 
twist someone's words, you twist their character in people's eyes. And so here God has been the one who's been generous and giving and so on. And suddenly, just one line, did he really say, you can't eat from any tree? Suddenly he's being made out to look restrictive, um, mean, and so on. I mean, you know, think about it. God, God gave one no in an entire world of yes. Now, yes, eat from any tree, but accept that one. So a world of yes in which there's one no, and Satan turns it into, is it a world of no? Very different picture of God. Of course, Eve uh, replies, uh, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the trees in the middle and so on, and you must not touch it. She repeats what God said pretty well, but there are actually a number of changes. And if you compare, I won't do it with you now, but if you read very carefully, particularly in the original, um, the, um, the, the, the lines in chapter 2 of what God did say and compare it to what she says here, there are three changes. God had said, you can certainly eat. It's emphatic. You most surely can eat from any tree. Eve just kind of turns the volume down a bit. It's just that we can but there's a change of language. God had said, you can eat from all trees, emphatic on everything, and Eve just says, you can eat, we can eat from the trees. And then most significantly, you must not touch it, which of course God had never said. Now we don't know for certain, but I think those, there are enough changes there, and you've read chapter 2 carefully, it's already had an effect on Eve. Somehow she is, is not thinking straight as a result. So Satan replies, verse 4, you will not certainly die. So God's word is twisted, then God's word is very simply denied. God said, eat it, you'll die. Satan says, no, you won't. Who are you going to believe? And Satan gives some reasons. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now this, of course, is also very clever. Uh, you know, they were made like God already, chapter 1. Same phrase. But he's offering sort of more God-likeness. You're made like him, but you can be even more like him. Your eyes will be opened in some way. You'll know good and evil. Uh, and so he paints God as restrictive. Uh, you know, if you ate this, you'd be, you'd be t too much like him for his liking. You know, God becomes like the insecure boss who wants to keep you down because you'll challenge his position or something. It's that kind of dynamic. So the woman sees the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, desirable for gaining wisdom. She takes some and she eats it. Of course, again, we should remember chapter 2. All the other trees were, same phrases, good for food, pleasing to the eye, plenty to choose from. But this one was desirable for gaining wisdom. And so she eats it for the knowledge of good and evil. Turns out Adam is there the whole way along, remaining completely silent and complies with her. So twisting God's word and denying God's word then leads to disobeying God's word. They eat it. Of course, the eyes of them, verse 7, then are opened. Have you ever thought about this? It's, it's curious. In many ways, Satan is absolutely right. In what ways is he right? You know, don't eat, don't eat, you, know, you won't die. God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened. He knows that when you eat it, you'll know good and evil. They didn't die. They didn't die. Well, it's one nil Satan. And their eyes are opened, two nil Satan. End of the chapter... You know, got, got, they mustn't have access to the tree of life because they've become like us, knowing good and evil. 3-0 Satan. 
He appears to be absolutely right. And yet, <laughs> and yet, when their eyes are opened and they have this knowledge, they don't like what they see. They, they thought they were going up in the world, but of course it's rightly been called a fall. Knowledge of God, good and evil is not what they bargained for. Their instinct is now to cover themselves compared to the sort of innocence they had previously. Their, their instinct now is to hide from God when he appears, and so on. Now look, there's been um, lots of debate over the, over the centuries as to kind of what's going on in sin. Uh, sin has been defined in various ways. It's been defined as disobedience, uh, particularly to God's law, um, Good, good evidence for that. You know, 1 John, sin is lawlessness. And clearly here, sin involves disobeying. And yet you have to ask, well, what's, what's going on? When you lift the lid up, uh, lift the bonnet up, what's the dynamic behind the disobedience? Uh, some have argued for um, unthankfulness, particularly working off Romans 1. They neither gave thanks to him nor glorified him as God. One of the really big contenders is pride. It's a prideful desire for what isn't rightly ours, and that's what motivates it. But the other thing I've, I've become very convinced of, uh, which is often uh, one of the options here, is belief. It's all about what they believe. See, sin involves disobedience, uh, but it's not simply law-breaking, it's relational. This is set in the context of, I'm your creator and Lord, who's given you, revealed myself to you and given you this law. We're made to relate to God, that relationship has a certain shape, he's God, we're not, and so on. So sin is a kind of relational rebellion, but motivated by what it is we think of him. Behind the act of disobedience is our view of God. Francis Turretin was a 17th century theologian, and he spoke of sin as false faith. Um, as they reached out for that fruit, as they disobeyed, as they rebelled, as they changed the shape of that relationship, what was going on? As they reached out for that fruit, what did they believe about God? Do you think? Yeah, maybe he'd lied. Maybe he was being unfair. Maybe he was holding them back. What do they believe about themselves? Deserve better. Could have more. Had greater potential. What do they believe about the act of eating? The act of disobeying? It would, it will it'll, it'll, it'll realize that potential. It'll, it'll be good for me in some way. See, as Eve, as Eve, see nobody made Eve sin. She, she wanted to eat it because of what she believed about God and herself and the fruit. Disobeying will be good for me. That was what she believed at that moment. She had false faith wasn't true but she had faith Satan doesn't force anyone to sin he deceives people so that they don't think straight so that they believe wrongly so that they have false faith now what I want to do in each of these sessions um, well, actually, sort of, we've got four, four bits. I don't know if we'll get through them all. We'll have a go. So here's the first one. Having covered a little bit of an area, what I want to do is to think about, well, if, if that's true, if, if as we lift the bonnet and we look at sin and we go, oh, that's, that's a part of sin, that's part of a dynamic of it, and here, that it is false faith, that is key in what is going on, then what are some of the implications of that? That could be implications for how we think ourselves, could be implications for ministry, there are all sorts of implications. Uh, so, with your neighbour for a moment, 
have a think. What would be some implications if this is a true dynamic going on in sin? I've got a few to feed in, but I'd like to hear some of your thoughts as well. Have a word with your neighbor for a second. If a key dynamic in sin is false faith, wrong belief, uh, what are some implications of that for view of life, ministry, pastoral care, fighting sin, anything? Call some out. Simon. Well, we'll, uh, uh, we'll be looking in the wrong place for uh, solutions. Yeah. So we'll, we'll look in the wrong place for solutions. Solutions to what? Um, well, a whole, I guess a whole number of things, but if sin is, if sin is doing wrong actions, predominantly wrong actions, we'll be looking to rectify that by doing right actions. Yes. Um, but, but if sin is fundamentally false faith, uh, the, the solutions will be in, in pointing us to Christ and true faith in him and what he is like yeah. uh, as, as the major component in yeah. the solution to that area, if that's pastoral care. So, thank you. So, m major issue in terms of how we fight sin um, is that we don't simply ask for right actions. We don't just say, sort of, stop it. Yeah. Do this instead. Al although, we, I, I, I take it we do say that. P Paul certainly says that. But, and this is where, you know... The, you know, uh, I have to bring a number of things into play, and there's always going to be a place for self-control. However, if all we do is effectively say, be more self-controlled, then we're not actually tackling some of the root dynamic going on. Do you have other thoughts along those lines? Well, wrong actions spring from a wrong heart. Yeah. Attitude. Yeah. And understanding. Yes. Yeah. The view of God and how big he is and yes. how sufficient he is. Yeah, so wrong actions from a wrong heart and, and so a wrong view. Thank you. Other hand of that? Also, the negative side of it is pointing out to people the, the false things they, they think they're going to find in sin, not just the good things that might have in God. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so there's both, there's both, as it were, the wrong belief about God, his goodness. Uh, the rightness of his commands, but there's also the wrong belief that this will give me something. You know, they thought they were going up in the world, and actually they fell. Uh, so we want to expose that more clearly. Yeah? Is the, is the basic problem, what you said earlier, <coughs> the inspiration book, um, you know, clearly, clearly I don't believe Yes. No, no. Um, no, I think I, th I, th I, I think you're under something there. Um, the, 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 the fact that people are oblivious to the core relationship that they are, they're kind of in whether they like it or not, because of the relationship to God has created this life giver, sustainer. He gives them each breath they breathe, and yet they ignore him. Um, that's, that's obviously huge. Now, I just, we, can, we can broaden it, though, I think, in this, in this thinking, f in terms of ev evangelistic contact. Everyone believes something about life. You know, the unbeliever has faith. They just have false faith. It's a more settled, predisposed false faith compared to the Christian. The Christian who sins, in a sense, has a, you know, they have a kind of an aberrant moment, or they have... You know, they haven't worked through all of the implications of their true faith in, 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 in the good God. Um, and so uh, at that moment, they are r running against their professed faith. The unbeliever, of course, is running with their professed faith. But in a sense, the issue is still the same. And asking an unbeliever what do they believe 
and what they believe about how they live is a perfectly appropriate question, rather than trying to persuade them into belief. Now, they've, just, they've, they've swallowed the whole lie, as it were, and so are living a life of false faith. I think also that, that's, that's quite key, isn't it? But they, don't, they think it's better for them. Yes. And they convince themselves, and we then convince ourselves, that that is better by far than following the good God. Yes. And that has a massive implication to talk to people, because they aren't, we, we're not talking to them because only they can see that it was bad for them. Yes. They're so convinced that it is for their best. Yeah. But actually, we need to show them what God is like and what He is like, because that's the best. Yeah. And in contrast to what they, you know, they're, they're doing, which isn't. Yeah. Or expose the difference between what we, what we say we believe, and often what we know we believe in in our in our heads, and how we're functionally acting. Yeah. But but we we functionally act in disbelief. Yes. So, so when that gets pointed out to us, we can be horrified that because actually we realize that I, I, do, I do believe that in my head, yes. but I'm not functionally believing that in how, I, yes. how I'm acting. Yes, yeah. And so exposing that yeah. Yeah. can be the, the, the catalyst for our everything. Absolutely, absolutely. So, there's, so in one sense, there's a very similar application to the non-Christian and the Christian the non-Christians in a more settled disposition, and I agree your comments on showing them the good God, then becomes key. Uh, the Christian is acting out of line with their professed belief, but they have a kind of a functional faith in the moment. Those of you who are familiar with um, CCEF type material and some of the idolatry paradigms and so on, you'll see the connections with this. I'm coming at it from a slightly different angle, but there's quite a lot of overlap there. Um, and I, and I think understanding sin as false faith ties a lot of those areas together quite, quite helpfully. It's also helpful, I think, I think uh, just reflecting what we were chatting here, uh, personally, how kind of fallen I am. Um, and that this, is, this is incredibly difficult. It's so easy to think, well, I'm a Christian, so I kind of know where I'm heading, so yeah, that's sin and that, blah, blah. But actually, just looking at that, going through it again, and thinking about how I do somersaults in my head about, well, I love the Lord and I know that he'll provide everything and just need to trust him. But actually, where his arms and legs are now? And so you can't quite do everything without us. So he kind of needs our help. So there's some things where, you know, of course he'll provide, but actually we need to do a little bit to provide for our families. Actually, we, we need a bit more money. We need a bit better job. We need this. And suddenly we're all... And I know I'm guilty. Hmm. We're, we're already living what we're saying we want to be against. Yep. And constantly needing to be on, honest about that. Yes. Because it's just a constant struggle. Yeah, yeah. So one of the most helpful things, I think, about studying the doctrine of sin is it's one of the most leveling doctrines. We have all had false faith. And we all continue to wrestle with false faith. So even though I might, see, I, I might think I see the world really clearly, got a good picture of God and his plan for the world and everything else, I still struggle with false faith, just as much as any other Christian does. And as we've just said, that dynamic is the same as the non-Christian. I should have great sympathy for the non-Christian rather than a kind of, you idiot. You know, can't, don't you get it? No, I was deceived as well and continue to be. It should make me very... Um, Jonathan Edwards had a great line about the doctrine of sin sort of rightly handled gives us great compassion for people because I kind of understand something of what's going on in them and know what it's like. You know, I've got, and I've got the disease too. A couple of last comments and we'll move on. I mean, I, I'm going to try and cover in a whole number of areas and we'll just have to keep, keep the pace up a little bit. Um, Thank you. There's some really, really good thoughts. Just to add, um, the, fight, the f fight for sin then will, it does involve self-control, but it also involves a fight for belief. We'll come back to this when we look, about, look at my heading underneath on sugar-coated poison, but it means, um, it means in wrestling with sin, just like I asked you what was happening as Eve reached out, what did she believe about God, believe about herself, believe about this action? Asking some of those questions over someone's sin in pastoral care particularly habitual sin, what are you believing in that moment? 
I think that's, that's, a, that's a very key question. Not there isn't a place for just going, you know, take radical action. Of course there is. But to get into the, some of the dynamics of what's going on in their heart. Uh, it means in our culture, it means we see our culture as deceived as to what is good for people. And that, I think that just explains so much. And the, the fight isn't just a fight. Isn't, it's not like a rearguard action fighting for some kind of lost Christian morality. It's over people's deception as to what is good. And of course, any analysis of sin should, and we're only going to point, I'm only going to give you a heading, we can't explore it, but it should just point us to something about the gospel. And I, did, I did this sermon series back at my church, and I did, I did say to people, this could be one of the most depressing sermon series I ever do, because I'm going to tell you about how we sin, and I'm going to tell you ways in which you should feel guilty you weren't even aware of, and so on. Um, but I, A, hoped that would actually be really helpful in understanding, lifting the bonnet up, etc., as we're finding now. But secondly, I longed that we would appreciate Jesus more. Now, I'm not going to spend much time appreciating Jesus. I just want to point you to that. And so if sin here is false faith, we appreciate Jesus as the second Adam who was utterly faithful and who always believed God on our behalf. And what I found is, is dissecting sin a little bit more and going, there's a little bit of it, and there's a bit of it, and sort of sp you know, spreading it out, means I do the same with Jesus, and I appreciate more things about him. Let's move to the right, top right-hand side, falling two ways. So you may need to fold your paper a different way. I have a table, so I'm fine, you know. Um, I want to think about Genesis 3 again, but thinking particularly from the idea of the image of God. So back in chapter 1, I put the verse there, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, that they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And that is then repeated. You know, so he made mankind in his image, male and female, he made, made them and so on. And he said to them, rule over. And you get this list repeated. Um, so uh, people are made in God's image. That's a very rich and deep concept, has lots of implications. But I think a key one, particularly in the Genesis material, is, ruler, is ruling. No, uh, this is the, the new NIV, and it actually makes it uh, a, a tight link. See the top line? In our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule. It doesn't have to be translated so that. It could just be, and they may rule. But I think there is a logical connection. Make them in our image, they're going to rule. And he hasn't kind of changed topic. A key part of how we image God is in our ruling function. And this, of course, is picked up in things like Psalm 8. You know, we're made lower than the angels, but higher than the animals, so that we will rule over them. Well, when we come to chapter 3, then, same passage we just looked at, I think there's a very interesting analysis we can make of it. And it's a sort of two sides to sin. Let me just back up slightly and tell you that in the sort of history of debates on sin, there have occasionally been efforts to try and um, uh, group them under, you know, sort of think, think of a tree. Um, you know, what are the main branches, you know, thick branches, off which there'll be lots of other branches? Are there one, two, three, four, five, whatever? How many branches are there of, of main sins, a category of sin, and all other sins are offshoots. So, for example, most famously, the seven deadly sins is an example of that. Uh, they they were, were originally referred to as seven capital sins. A capital as in kind of like heading. All other sins would fall under those seven. But then others have discussed, well, of, of the seven, 
might there be two that are actually kind of even more foundational? Um, and, I, and, I th and I think that's right, and I, that's what I want, I want to identify here. That's what we're doing. We're looking at sort of the main categories, hence my title, Falling Two Ways. And the first category is overreaching. And in the seven deadly sins, it is the sin of pride. It's a prideful, overreaching, wanting to be like God. And of course, it's ironic because they are made like God, but they want to be more godlike than they are already. Uh, and as a result, they overstep the mark, they break God's law, they transgress because they say, no, I can decide, I want to do it, I have the right, as it were. But the second dynamic going on is underachieving and failing to be like God. And this brings us back to the snake being a snake. And why I read chapter 1, verse 26. They were supposed to rule over the animals, including things that crawl along the ground. And so, one of the things that is happening in Genesis 3, when they listen to the snake and fail to exercise rule, is they are effectively failing to live up to what they were supposed to be as those made in God's image. They kind of abdicate. And rather than going, I was put in charge of you, <laughs> they go, oh, okay, I'll go along with you. So there is both a prideful overreaching, I want what I shouldn't have, I want to be more like God. And there is a failing to be like God in ruling over creation and living out the image of God that they have been given. Now, I think in the first sin, in this, this original sin, those two things are going on at the same time. They're two parts of the same, two sides of the same coin. And I don't think they are necessarily present in every sin like that, but I do think as the, sort of, as the, 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 the Bible narrative goes on, we see them as two main branches. As I say, the first one has often been called pride. Uh, the second one has often been called... Anyone? Sloth. Sloth. Very good. Which is an unfortunate word, because you don't use it today uh, very much. And if we do use it, it refers to a very lazy animal <laughs> that lives in trees or something. Um, it, it refers to an attitude of laziness or sort of sluggishness or inertia. I think it's best seen as the as a, like a, the op as, as opposites. It's 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 the opposite of when I should step up and grasp the nettle, and I take a step backwards instead of forwards, and I fail where uh, and so on. There are lots of sport on at the moment. Um, let me use a sporting illustration. Pride would be the football player who wants it to be all about them wants the spotlight on them and goes, look at me, I'm great. And sloth would be the player who hangs back, never, use, never reaches their full potential. You know, uh, commentators sometimes talk about, people, about players going missing in games. You know, they're on the field, but they're not, they're not really working and doing their part, playing their part. And we then see this, I think, in the Old Testament law. Lots of laws restrict people. Do not do this. This is off limits. You know, do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not make idols. Don't use false weights, etc. And you can disobey in an arrogant way that says, no, I want that. Prideful overreaching. But other laws say, do, do this. Honour your parents. Give justice to your neighbour. Speak truthfully. Care for the poor. Now, I always like the one that says, you know, if you, if you find your neighbour's donkey wandering in the street, you, know, you don't just go, it's a shame. I'm busy. You're supposed to take it back. 
You know, there are positive, you should do this laws. And you can then disobey in a different way of by falling short of them. You can think about this too as sort of the transgression of a law versus falling short of a law. And then some people use the, 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 the examples of commission and omission. What I commit and what I omit to do. And in one sense, that's, that's fairly obvious. I th just think coming at it from the angle of image of God gives it a slightly different kind of basis. And when I commit a law, when I transgress, I am saying I want to be God in this situation and decide the rules for myself. And when I omit a law and I fall short, I fail to live up to what God made me to be. And I think we see this in the New Testament too. New Testament instructions on how to live, things like Colossians 3, uh, Ephesians 4, explicitly use the image of God language. You're being renewed in the image of your creator. But in being renewed in that way, there are then things that you mustn't do, you must put off, you know, don't speak, don't speak um, you know, untruthfully and you know, greed and uh, sexual morality. And there are things you must put on. You must become loving and caring and humble and so on. So there's, there's both something to avoid and something to live up to because being made in the image of God is not a neutral thing. It's being made to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Ephesians 4, 22-ish. Or James 4 says, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and does not do it, it's sin. Think, um, think of a house. I do quite a lot of DIY in our house. Um, there are two ways you can wreck a house. Uh, deliberate vandalism, where you, you know, throw a brick through the windows and graffiti on the walls. And the other is neglect. Just don't do anything. So in God's world, as those made in his image, we can wreck his world and our lives and those around us through moral vandalism, where we break his laws, and through moral negligence, where we fail to live up to what we were supposed to be. So it's there in the classic Anglican confession, we have left undone those things we ought to have done and have done those things we ought not to have done. Or well, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, what is sin? It is any want of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. So as I say, when you read those, you're going to go, oh, yeah, that's fairly obvious. I think putting the image of God behind it and living up to that image, living out who I'm called to be in God's image, but not overstepping that and wanting to be like God uh, is a helpful way of thinking about it. Let's um, do the same thing again. If that is true, if that's part of the dynamic of sin, that I could overreach or underachieve, what might some implications be for ourselves and pastoral ministry and so on? Talk to your neighbour for a second and see what you come up with. And I've got a few thoughts for you. Okay, let's hear some thoughts. Implications of thinking about sin that way. How is that helpful? Yeah. Personally, also, those of us who are responsible for the future, maybe we uh, look at the overreaching law rather than the, the underachieving. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We've, we've, thank you, that's really helpful. We, we very easily focus on the, trend, the obvious transgression. Yeah. Um, which we, we should, we should call a spade a spade and so on. 
But that's only half the story. And it means, I think, you, could, you can get a lot of kind of middle class sin, effectively, that flies under the radar. Because it's not overt transgression. We were, we were talking about that you can try and deal with that by making rules and things which actually then become, you know, you, you categorise them as, you know, unless you do three hours a week for the church, mm. that's that's long. Unless you give this much money, that's, you know, so you're, you're trying to you're trying to do it, but you can do that in a very misguided way, in yeah. a very sort of, you know, pharisaical way, yeah. and not deal with it properly from God's point of view. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, could, you can start to put your own impositions on people rather than kind of ask yourself, what does it mean? I mean? A great question I think to ask then is, what does it mean for this person to live out being image of God and growing into that image in true righteousness and holiness? And that presumably it will look different for different people in different settings, but there's a, for people to realize there's a call on their life to live a certain way, not just a call not to live a certain way. So not just the negative, but the positive. And there is, there is in there, actually, then a, a really, and a very attractive, I think, picture of Christian growth. Now, I want to call you to live like this as you were made to. And that's the great sense in Colossians 3 and Ephesians 4 of recapturing what you were meant to be, rather than all of my kind of discipleship of you is telling you what you shouldn't do. You know, cut off the bad bits. And that, if you only focus on transgression, that's what it will always sound like. I think we often tie, often keep children, sin, children doing the wrong things. Yes. Not doing, avoiding the right things. Yes. Yeah. In the last phase, they yeah. Can. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Another hand one. I think it's also helpful with the way you describe there and making it personal to, to individuals and what that person is called. Yeah. For some of these folks, this smallest thing is a huge thing. Yeah. So I, I, I guess it's really helpful to, yeah. to have to individually what is God calling that person in his or her circumstances yeah. to do. Yeah. 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 As you can say, it, 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 it's, it's much a question of just this the underachieving of is there a connection then when we're talking to people about spiritual dryness that we do look at that it's the works that doing more but actually just what they're not doing and therefore not believing. Yes. No. Connecting your, the, the first point. Yeah. No, no, I think that's right. So it is a false faith that they don't think that they should be what God has called them to be. Yes. Yes. I, I agree completely. I wasn't going on to that. But I think if you ask what's the similarity between overreaching and underachieving, it's back to false faith. You either believe God has restricted something good from me and I want it and I'll like it and I'll achieve my potential if I get it. Or you don't believe him that it would be good to live this way, that I must accept this responsibility, that I must, no, no I'm going to be self-protective. But that's a lack of faith. So it's a very similar, di- if, if you like, if there are two big branches, there's one trunk. Yeah, yeah, the one thing. yes, yeah, 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 yeah. So it means we're going to have a concern for both sides of sin. Um, and we already said sins of, of omission, I think, can be hidden uh, more easily. So we need, to, we need to learn as those in ministry to recognize absence of what there should be as well as pr- the presence of what there shouldn't be. Um, I think that means you have a very rich picture of what, being living out the image of God looks like in marriage and parenting and church life and hobbies and leisure and so on, because people could live a very sort of pleasant life, you know, come to church and do their job and whatever, but they, they fail to love people um, uh, and serve. 
know, they might be, they might not steal, I'll be honest, on their tax returns, but they haven't grown in generosity and so on. Um, you know, we could never, we could maybe, we don't get angry or spread gossip or blow up at people, but we don't use our words to build other people up. A passive Christian life can be as sinful as an obviously sort of rebellious Christian life. And then it means we realize our responsibilities. How could I wreck my marriage, for example? It could be through moral vandalism, adultery, pornography, inappropriate relationships. But it could be through neglect. So I could just ignore my wife. Now, it might take longer, and we'll be less of a bust up, and so on, but we'll end, I'll wreck my marriage by not stepping up to what I should be, as it were. I remember hearing um, a pastor once talk about um, a family situation where the daughter had gone completely off the rails. I can't remember exactly, into drugs, got, got pregnant, whatever happened, teenager. And he was meeting with the family. And at one point, having explored some of the things going on, the father kind of sat back and folded his arms and, sort of went, and just sort of went, well, actually, folded his arms, arms up. He went, he went you know, I haven't done anything here. You know, I haven't done anything wrong, sort of thing. But he expressed it something like, I haven't done anything. It's like, not my fault. And the pastor already pointed at him and just went, and that is your sin. Because you you've, you've, not, you've not engaged. No, not that if he had, it would have, you know, you're not responsible for your children's behavior, etc. But he had been a step back father, do what you like, blah, 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 and then it goes all badly wrong, it's not my fault. We need to challenge that. That's moral negligence. And then, as I say, positively, it gives us a lovely picture of growth. And we want to hold out to people, here's what God made you to be. Grow into this in true righteousness and holiness, rather than a, whatever you do, don't do, X, Y, and Z. Which is a pretty negative picture of Christian growth. Uh, lastly, we should just give a headline in pointing to Jesus who, of course, comes and is the perfect image of God, who then lives out all that God calls him to and never overreaches. And he does that perfectly for us. And we are given that true righteousness and holiness in him.